Um, so there's been a lot of concern and talk about a low global price um, for coffee lately, and um, the SCA, the Coffee Association, has has a separate like price crisis response <laughs> team um, producing sort of materials and stuff and. Um, I don't know what they've done, but I think a lot of what they've, the conversation that they've sort of had, the articles they've produced have been really good. Um, I used some of the articles for, th um, I'm basically working on like three or four different things right now to, to sort of put into print to try to synthesize these things into something that's like useful for people and that makes some sort of sense. Um, and I'm trying to make sense of it myself. So it may be funny like in coffee, you think like, there's, oh, there's somebody, they're a coffee expert, there's people who know a lot about coffee. And I think the fact is like, people know certain things about coffee, but very, very few people know a broad amount about coffee from the commercial range, from the tra as a trading commodity, and in specialty and tasting and cupping. Very few people actually have a broad uh, 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 knowledge, and very few people, you know, people either know or, uh, coffee at origin, know producing coffee as an agricultural product, they know it as an exporter, they know it as an importer, but you always know it through a specific lens. You don't really know it broadly. So when I'm reading some of this stuff, it's like reading a foreign language to me, some of it. I just, uh, I don't know much about financial markets. I don't know much about the coffee as the basis for a commodity exchange. And so you really have to kind of like forget about coffee so much. You have to learn about the broader picture of like, um, because the answers aren't really within coffee. So, you know, coffee started to be traded 170 years ago, I believe, through an exchange. Before that, there was trading um, in other commodities. They say, like, rice was traded uh, since the 1500s, 1600s in, in Asia using forward contracting. Uh, using projections of my crop will be ready at this time, but I want to know now what my price is going to be. And as the buyer, I want to know what I'm going to pay because I'm not sure what it's going to be when the rice is ready. So then they make a forward contract. Um, nowadays in coffee, very few people who make contracts are actually involved in coffee at all. So I've had some entertainment reading the um, financial websites, the sort of, uh, to when I'm sort of training up on, on these terms, and when they actually try to talk about coffee, like how is coffee processed, where is it grown, what makes coffee good or bad, it's pretty funny. It's because there's no knowledge there. <laughs> um, and I would say that I've even been in touch with people who are, traders in Switzerland in coffee, which is the hub for, for coffee trading. All the big companies trade in Switzerland. And um, cupping like isn't even part of their, their regimen. They're not really, um, they, they haven't had a quality focus and they don't even know when they actually have really good coffee that they produce within their company group. They don't even really know it. They don't know why it's good, etc. Now, a lot of people are changing that, but it's pretty shocking to have someone <clears throat> trading millions of bags of Arabica coffee and not know what a good cup of coffee is. Um, that seems very foreign to someone like me. Yeah, and actually, let me, let me start out by telling you about these two coffees. Um, so the, they're from two people I know pretty well. I've been um, visiting these people for a while. Um, this, this is a guy named Ephraim who built a washing station um, right in Kayanza, which is kind of ground zero for really great coffee in Burundi. And he is currently um, working in cooperation, this is very actually unique and unusual, with a company that is roasting and selling coffee in Burundi. And they sell it, they have a cafe in Bujumbura, they have uh, coffee in the airport. And they're a local brand. And this is actually shocking and very exciting to go to a country that produces coffee and actually be able to get a really good cup of coffee. So that, in 10 years ago, forget it. Um, they're, um, co you know, unlike wine, you, don't, you visit Napa to get closer to the winery and you think you get closer to the source, you get closer to quality. And coffee's always been the opposite. In fact, 
in, if I'm not mistaken, it was Burundi where you were not even allowed to possess grade one export coffee. That, uh, that had, to go, had to be exported. It was illegal to keep it in the country, your good coffee. Um, and I'll go into why that's important. Because it actually has a really important basis, and that is because the country needs foreign capital. The country needs money. And coffee is an export product, and I'll show you why it's so critical in Burundi. Um, anyway, this is really cool because this if you want this coffee, you have to go to Burundi and get it. And that's very unique. This is a, a guy that I know really well. He has um, a partner for the station Morambi, and he has a different partner who is our exporter for a station called Agahore. And, um, the story with this coffee this year is they built this new station. They did this water project. It's a beautiful station in an area serving a kind of a, a bunch of smallholder farmers in the area that bring their cherry in. And they projected to have about, I think, 300 um, tons, metric tons, cherry to buy this year. So far, they've had 8,000. I mean, eight, eight, I'm sorry, eight tons, eight tons total. Brought to the brought to the station. So what's happening this year is there's because Burundi has really old trees, because it's all Bourbon coffee, it's old variety of coffee. What's happened is they experience a very large biennial cycle, uh, up year and a down year naturally. Um, last year was a great harvest. This year is just terrible. Their station, but nobody has, is as, as terrible as this station, and it's really sad because. A lot of the current conversation about the global coffee market is about pricing, price, pay more for coffee, what's the price for coffee, and that's going to help farmers. But it's actually volume. If you just don't have any coffee to sell, it doesn't matter if somebody gave you $20 a pound for it. It doesn't work. And volume is, is continuously a thing that people, I find, don't really discuss. They talk about price and, qual and price for quality as the formula, but it's actually volume really matters a lot. I want to keep it to Burundi, but I want to kind of just go into what I've been sort of learning about the global market a little bit. And I, when I was writing this piece, and I was writing this last night, so um, I was trying to remind myself of why this mattered at all. So one reason why the coffee market is so foreign to business like mine is that we just don't care. We don't, we don't um, there's periods where I've checked the market a lot, and for the most part, I would look uh, once a month, once every six months at where, where, where the global Arabica price was at. Um, it just, um, because we're buying coffee on basically an outright agreement on price with a, with a, with a farmer or with a supplier. Um, people are telling us what we, they need, we're basically saying, let's, you know, and a lot of times it's just let's do what we did last year because last year's price was good. And what they want is a consistent price year to year. That's what works for us. That's what works for them. And in fact, that's what the market was designed to do. That's exactly who the market, the global market was, you know, uh, designed to serve. And I'm sure there's are some people who are still served in that way. It's about risk reduction. And um, knowing that you can continue with this sort of long-term investment in a product like coffee, which isn't like corn or soybean. I don't know much about those, but I imagine that you can take your soybean field and plant corn next year, or, or at least you, know, you can transition those crops. Coffee is you know, at least a five-year proposition when you plant it. So um, it's very strange in some ways that it's ended up being treated like a commodity, just like corn and soybeans, et cetera, um, or canola oil or orange juice futures. So, so why does it matter at all to us? And the whole thing is, is that we don't exist in a vacuum, that even a really small company that goes down and buys their 20, 30, 50 bags of coffee, or in our case, one container, two containers of coffee um, with micro lots in it. Um, uh, that, that exists in a context, in a, in a regional situation, where um, the competition 
for coffee and therefore the price for coffee is being determined by global factors, by larger companies, by middle people who have investment money to, um, to buy coffee and trade in coffee locally. And that's all guided by a global market. So, um, so what happens, for example, I think I was writing about this, um, saying that here that, um, you know, I could go to a farmer and say, you know, I could, I could do a differential price with them. I could say, look, the market's at 120. We'll give you a dollar over the market because your coffee's really good. So let's say it's, I'm just making up numbers, it's 220. Um, and that could be great for them. Um, you could also just go to them and say, let's, what's a good price for you? What works for you for this crop? 220. You could get to this, the same thing. The problem is what, is what happens next year when the markets, um, you know, $3. Let's say the market moves to one of these extreme highs and it's very volatile. Um, so what's so strange is that he's just growing his coffee as normally. I'm buying my coffee as normally. We're behaving in the same ways, but the market has, has affected this region. And now you're going to have, he, he's going to have a lot of other options to go sell his coffee at much higher prices because of the price basis. So he'd be doing me this massive favor to sell it at 80 cents loss at uh, the same price as last year um, in that climate. And so it's very disruptive to business like me when we've had these price spikes. Um, and they just don't have anything to do with anything in reality. They have to do with, um, with the, the factors that create volatility in the market. The thing is, is that people who just simply invest in the market for profit absolutely want volatility in the market. People who actually don't take delivery of coffee or receive coffee benefit from volatility because you make money in the market, whether it goes up or down based on how you work your futures contracts with, with options and stuff like that. You know, the main point is how, why, why a global market even matters for just people who are basically interested only in quality and paying for quality. So I had also, you know, listed some of the, the other factors that influence it are these things called ECT. Um, they're commodity funds that st started to be in, um, come into existence, I think, in the uh, 2003 or something like that. And what it did is it made investing in commodity markets, um, their electronic funds, as simple as your mutual fund or anything else. So people could use commodity markets as a place to put money, um, whether that's for a matter of seconds or an hour or a matter of days or a short period of time. And these funds would jump in and out of the market. They would come in at the beginning of the market, they would jump out at the close. And this funding created a new different kind of volatility in the market because in the old type of, of coffee exchange, which was like an open outcry exchange where someone's like, hey, I'll sell you this, oh, okay. Uh, you know, and they had all this. The speed of it and the amount of people who could participate in it was kind of limited to some degree. And some, some commodity crops, from what I understand, on the Chicago Board of Trade are still open outcry. Like, um, I won't, we're not going to say what, but I think Chicago Board of Trade still has open outcry. Uh, they haven't gone fully electronic. So that really shifted the dynamics in the market. It made it, um, you know, it brought a kind of speed and volatility that wasn't there before. And then, you know, um, the, the fundamental uh, commodity market, you know, you have this underlying product. It's not, um, most trades are not made in the actual product, you know, but you need that product to create the value that then people are going to base their trading on, you know. So just like, for example, with money as a commodity, we don't have a gold standard anymore, but we still have value to the money and act, act as though we do. And at one time you could actually go get the gold that represented your cash. So it's become unhinged, unhinged from the actual value of the commodity. And then most people participating in it will never touch any coffee that they buy, sell, trade. They're just simply um, in and out for their own you know, purposes, which could be 
risk. It could be the best place to put their money momentarily, like in, with electronic funds, or it could be, um, you know, just just profit seeking within the commodity itself. Um, I was trying to say about commodity crops is, uh, I'm sorry, grain and um, what you call soft commodities. This is um, minerals, oil, or hard commodities and grains and such are uh, gro grown products are called soft commodities and they're generally more um, variable and volatile because of the fact that um, they are influenced by weather patterns they are, do have cycles of up and down years and they do um, um, and so you know there used to be a thing that um, if, if Brazil sneezes, the world catches a cold. And that's because any report from Brazil about whether there was a frost or a little bit of cold that was going to affect the coffee crop, and the whole market would go berserk. Of course, people benefited from the rumor <laughs> of something going bad and stuff because they wanted that in order to, to, trade, um, to trade and make money. So I think... Um, I'll leave it at that. Let me tell you just a couple things if you don't know about the market. The market's traded through the ICE in New York. It's called the New York Sea. Uh, London has the Robusta Commodity Exchange. New York has the uh, Arabica Co Commodity Exchange. The commodity that's being traded is not a bean or a bag. It's 37,500 pounds of coffee. It's a, a contract is called is 37,500 pounds of exchange grade coffee. So um, the thing about trading in coffee is you actually don't need all the money for that 37,500 pounds of coffee. You can do through different you know financial vehicles. You can be trading in coffee and only have something like two thousand uh, dollars. I think um, I'm not a trader, but. Um, but the main thing is, is that in order to have to be in the financial position to do that, you have to be sizable in a certain way because there could be a situation where you're stuck actually receiving 37,500 pounds of coffee you don't want. So, um, and being and paying for it. And then there's also uh, if you if if um, you're playing some games with like. Short, um, short selling or something, you could get stuck and actually have to come up with money that you may not have. So there's a, a privilege involved in being able to participate in coffee trading that a lot of farms don't have access to. You'd have to be a really big farm. You'd have to have a financial security and you'd have to have your farm like um, as collateral likely to do the trading unless you had some other business. So I know people in origin countries who, uh, who hedge, um, meaning they buy contracts to protect their pricing for their own harvest, etc. But not a lot of them are in that position. The other thing is that you have to be trading in that volume of coffee. You have to be doing 37, 000, full containers of coffee, 37,500 pounds of coffee. So small farmers, even if they had financial stability to get a loan and to, to, to be to be secured in that way to trade couldn't you know couldn't do it. Um, so it's exclusive um, the market is exclusive in that way and excluding uh, in that way too. I wanted to switch to talk about Burundi. So these are some trading charts just to show you the range of prices. So this is just 2019. And this is what's been happening in the market. So we've been, um, this is fairly low. Um, it's not as low as the 2001 crisis price crash. Um, but we did get quite low. Um, so it's been between a dollar eight and you know 90 cents. And this isn't, if I was actually on the site, it will show you these live graphics. And it's really easy to go to go find this stuff for yourself. This is a historic view of coffee since. 1975. So, um, so what you see is, yeah, I mean, you see these cycles of volatility and these huge spikes um, up towards 350. And I, I actually, I'm, I'm, I re totally remember the 70s coffee crisis because it, coffee got really expensive and everyone, everyone got really concerned. But you can see 
how it comes out of these, these peaks and valleys are so extreme. And, um, and this doesn't, what this doesn't include here is that we got extremely low in, in 2018 and we're down, um, we're down well below a dollar again. Um, not, at, not, not this low, but that, that low didn't last very long. And at this low, um, you know, many people were just basically abandoning farms in Central America. They were just saying, screw it, um, it's not worth it. So um, I wanted to show this because partly I was talking a lot about, um, a lot of the conversation in coffee has been about cost of production. Um, like that we're at this point right now where what we're paying for coffee is below the cost to produce the coffee. And this has been a really hard, I mean, it's, it's a very, very salient argument, one that people can, you know, relate to because you know you have your own checkbook and you're like, hey, we're spending too much, we got to cut back, you know, we can't make the rent, we're living beyond our means, etc. It's really easy to figure out your own financial situation. It's extremely difficult when you get into large groups of people. And when I talk about Burundi, you'll kind of see how it's so difficult to understand cost of production. There's been a lot of work in it lately, though, and a lot of predictive um, uh, ways of working with it. But in some cases in, in, in the coffee business, when I've heard of people talk about trying to create a new relationship with a producer that is based on cost of production and making sure they're getting that, um, it's been like these situations where it's like one big farm who can, you know, it's basically like an individual almost. And it's very easy for, uh, that, uh, even that's hard, but it's actually very easy to figure out, you know, if they are not making it based on what they're getting for their harvest. I mean, that's gonna be, if they keep good records, you're gonna know pretty easily if it's not working out. A situation like, like the way coffee's grown in Burundi is completely different where you have smallholder farmers. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, but I wanted to mention one thing here, which I think is a very important, um, and at this moment in history would be extremely significant, is that I know, and um, from firsthand experience, um, I was in Guatemala, you know, coming out of this crash when people were, farmers were telling me that Starbucks had saved their coffee business by instituting, <laughs> I know, it's funny, <laughs> by instituting their own internal $1.20 minimum price. They weren't gonna go, um, so you know, that's up where that hole is in the wall. <laughs> that's where Starbucks was gonna, uh, they weren't gonna go below that. And that would be, that's an amazing thing to happen with a large volume coffee buyer. And it's kind of what we really actually need right now. Although the SCA price crisis committee, I don't think, has floated that, and I haven't heard any company like Ely, um, Starbucks, uh, Nespresso, um, the biggest company is now JAB Holding Company, which um, is a whole nother story. JAB is the largest coffee buyer in the world now. And you might have seen them because they've had articles on them recently about their kind of um, Nazi past. Um, they're trying to reckon with that. But they're this brand consolidator who's bought incredible amounts. They own Panera Bread, they own pret a -Measure, they own Snapple and Dr. Pepper, they own Keurig Green Mountain, they own Stumptown, they own Intelligentsia, they own this company called Trade, which um, it's like you can buy all these kind of roasted coffees from all these small roasters through Trade. Um, Pete's, they own Pete's. Um, and some of the, a couple of those they don't own outright, like Dr. Pepper, um, but. So if a company like that came in and, and put a, a minimum price up there on their, on their commodity coffee, on massive container, you know, container after container of coffee, be incredibly significant for countries like Burundi. I wanted to show you this graphic about So as you, as you could, I, does anybody have anything they want to say? Or I hope this isn't so scattershot. It's just because I'm actually like in the process of learning about these things and don't have it all nailed down as a presentation. Um, but if you have any comments, please just talk. 
<laughs> so Burundi's, Burundi, it's a good question. Burundi's in East Africa. It's um, right by Rwanda. Um, it's on Lake Tanganyika. It borders uh, Uganda and uh, Tanzania. So it's in that, in that group, and I, I should have had a map. <laughs> I mean, it would be uh, very helpful, but you can maybe probably just pull it up on your phone, too. Um, Burundi's uh, not as small as Rwanda, but very small. Ethnically, it's really related to Rwanda. They had their own genocide, which isn't talked about much, and lasted many, many years, their civil war. Um, so this, I thought, was a really stunning graphic. And it, it may be in the other presentation that I'm going to use um, about Burundi. So the percent of coffee in their total exports. So this is how dependent they are on coffee. And, um, and they're like off the charts, pretty much. Ethiopia, uh, Burundi does not export that much coffee. They have a very old, well-developed, sophisticated coffee system. Um, but next to Ethiopia, they're nothing. So this has nothing to do with volume. This has to do with how critical coffee is to their foreign exports. Then what I was observing on my trip in Burundi was to um, look at this um, really amazing analysis of their coffee sector and recommendations for their government about what they can do um, about it in the, in the global scheme. And this is from... May 2018, and it was written by three um, economists, basically. And the one guy, Dan Clay, I know is, is really knowledgeable specifically about Burundi coffee. One of the things here is that Burundi had a system called of soja stalls, is what they called them. And they were government-owned coffee washing stations. They had a very kind of a strong... Um, government-guided coffee system where um, they felt that that was the best way. The farmers grow the, grow the cherry. The farmers bring the cherry to their local washing station. It's processed, and they get a, a set price for, for the coffee cherry. So what happened is they decided that they needed to liberalize that. They needed to open that up to private investment. And the reason was because after 20 years, it really wasn't going anywhere. Um, they weren't getting out of the sort of lowest uh, price tier, um, even though it's very good washed coffee. And some of the soja style coffee is amazing. It's all like double fermented um, with uh, washing. It's a re really like the best system for processing washed coffee. But one of the interesting things that um, uh, that you see here is this huge drops in the crop volume. Um, and when that happens, when you have these down years like this year in Burundi, um, it's just absolutely devastating for not just an individual farmer who then, you know, it's like going fishing and you're, you know the price of fish and the price of fish is fine or whatever. It's actually, you know, um, coffee price could be better, but it's okay. But if you don't catch anything, <laughs> what does it matter? Um, you know, if you catch one fish when you expect it to catch 20, it doesn't matter. And that's what coffee is like. It's that random um, that you just don't have any volume to sell. Um, and you have these really good years where likely the price goes down because there's an oversupply of coffee. So last year when I was in Burundi, I saw there was coffee still in the warehouse unsold from last year because they don't even have the, the mechanism and the attack, attachment to the market to sell it. Um, so there's some stability in here, but see very low volume. And they're just trying to outline that the general trend has just been down, down, down on the average. It's, it's whether a lot of it is... Um, you will, min you will still have, with an old variety like Bourbon, a traditional variety, you'll still have these peaks and valleys, but they'll be minimized if you have a really aggressive fertilization, like organic fertilizer scheme, if you replant. So um, a lot of the farms I went to in Burundi are smallholder plots of like 500 trees. They're all 30 years old. They're all planted at the exact same time. There hasn't been a single tree planted in the meantime. So it's just like they're all getting old together and they're all sort of experiencing the highs and lows together. And I think that a variety of um, 
of ages of trees would help mitigate that a lot. Um, but definitely, definitely weather, and then just, yeah, the investment in the labor and inputs into the coffee trees to keep them healthy and producing. I mean, and every time you have a node, it could produce flower or it could produce leaves, depending on what the plant needs and what the energy the plant has. And to produce flowers and fruit for any plant it takes an incredible amount of energy. Um, they need to be very well supplied with organic material and fertilizer, um, you know, natural fertilizer, hopefully, in order to produce fruit. Um, so a lot of times, if a tree like is really old, it will have like a crown of leaves that have nothing down below. And what it, the signal will always be produce leaves. It will never really be focused into producing fruit. This is about, yeah, the pricing of Burundi coffee uh, and how it's just generally been low out of the baseline of all other East, East African coffees. So not really appreciated for what it is. And, you know, I personally think it's one of the greatest coffees in Africa. It's just not the showiest coffee in Africa. It doesn't win all the good food awards, but uh, it really is amazing coffee. Um, and this is um, kind of comparing productivity. So the productivity is incredibly low. And that matters a lot. Um, and it's, it's just a discussion right now, I think, you know, because you have a lot of coffee roasters and small roasters who are very concerned, obviously, about low prices and the impact and the sustainability of, of just getting coffee in the future, um, a lot of focus is on price. But you can see that um, your productivity is incredibly important, too. I mean, like I said, if you have, you know, nothing to sell, you get nothing. And the, so the other point about that is, given that the foreign capital, uh, foreign exchange money coming into Burundi is from coffee, when they have a low crop year, it's devastating. And the other background information on that is that um, Burundi relies on, on US aid, um, among other things. Um, they rely on China to build the, uh, the presidential palace. He's got quite a nice palace going up, paid for by China. But USAID has done a lot of things towards health care um, and other things. And it's, it's always been, in Africa, there's this kind of little uh, game they play um, they, with uh, um, trying to improve uh, the um, fight against human trafficking, which is a really big issue in some countries. And it's not an issue in, in Burundi, really. Um, the problem is, is that just the requirements to document that you didn't have any human trafficking and that to do your due diligence and produce this report in order to satisfy the USAID and, and the funding um, is really onerous for a really small country like this that um, doesn't have a lot of, of means. So it's happened this last year with John Bolton is he uh, and the Trump administration decided not to um, uh, what's, what's happened typically is it's been more of the carrot than the stick. Instead of, they, they, they've known that they have, don't really have a problem. They know that they can't really produce the report. They give them a little scolding and say, you have to do better next year to produce this report and prove that human trafficking is not a growing issue in Burundi. Um, but we're going to give you your funding. And the funding is, goes to the government for health care, for like local, um, for, you know, a lot of, very worthwhile um, projects. And this year, they didn't give them the funding. They said no. There was no sort of, it was the stick, not the carrot. So you know that was within the rights of the agreement, but it really has a devastating effect. When you combine that with the fact that there's no foreign exchange, very low foreign exchange coming into the country, um, it's going to be a really, really hard year on the whole country. So. Um, this, this is, I thought, very, very, very interesting. And there's a couple of, of things here. Um, is about um, who has to invest more on what, what farm size is most efficient to produce coffee with the least, most coffee with the least amount of, of, of work, basically. And this is a really big problem all across Africa, is that 
you're, you know, we celebrate like small farms and stuff, but when you're getting to this level that's so small, it's no longer really worth it. You're actually investing way more in your coffee than if you get to the level above here, 421 trees, where your return on your investment is, is much better. And that literally comes out as um, BIF is Burundi francs. So uh, if you're under 115 trees, um, you're spending a lot more, and that's the money that you're supposedly getting for your coffee. So it's less, you get less money and you spend more for it. So it's less of a winning proposition. Um, and one of the things in Rwanda that they've been trying to do, Rwanda is such a contrast because it it's, has a very aggressive um, um, attempts to sort of mitigate problems within the coffee industry. They're very proactive, let's say. And one of them that people would like to see is to have neighbors take over your farm. If you, if you have 100 trees and they have 300 trees, maybe you should do something else with your time and money and your neighbor should become the coffee farmer for you and them and you could work out something. And they want to have a legal arrangement for consolidation of farms just because of that last slide I showed you. Because when you get up to a certain threshold, it actually starts making money and you do less work and it's more worth it per tree and you actually end up keeping more of the money you receive for your coffee cherry. And you can see it just doesn't, so, it's so much more extreme when you're under, in this case, 115 trees versus 421 trees. So, and let me see. So this is again showing does the productivity uh, in the smallest farms pay off? And it's kind of flat lines over here, but on the smallest farm, it doesn't actually pay off in that much more coffee cherry per tree. Um, they, these are very low. Uh, Burundi has very low productivity per tree. In this case, it's, it's two kilos a tree at the highest level. And a kilo, a kilo of coffee cherry was 500. Uh, Burundi francs when I was there. It's, it's incredibly low. I'm thinking it's 30, 40 cents. So that's just per tree, you know, um, that's not a winning proposition. And then here's the profitability you can see as you get into a larger, a larger farm of at least 420 trees. And 420 trees is really, is really nothing. Twenty seven cents. That's that's the if you're selling your cherry, that's what you're getting. Per seven cents per tree. Yeah, well I think in this case of two kilos, so it's uh you know uh, 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 yeah. Fifty two. Fifty fifty four cents, yeah. Fifty two cents, yeah. So um um, is there an equation for cherries versus beans? Yeah, it's, I, if, I, if I'm recalling correctly, it should be six to one. It depends on a lot of things. So uh, to get uh, a single kilo of cherry, you would need six kilos. I mean, so single ki kilo of green, you need six kilos of cherry. Okay, well, yeah, this was, this was from a present, this was part of a presentation that was like a round table presentation presented to the government of, in Burundi to try to sort of move them in a direction towards um, better policies. So one of the things that's been really positive in Rwanda and Burundi is, is some of the policies and it's kind of a good thing because Burundi can always sort of copy from Rwanda next door. It's like having your, your big brother that's always cooler and doing the smarter, better things and has more money, you know. So, um, so a lot of those things have been like, um, They've tried to create regions for washing stations, so only farms within that washing station region can deliver the cherry to that station. And it was kind of trying to make uh, equal opportunity for all the washing stations. So big washing stations would come up and buy all, you know, send out trucks and uh, buy up all the cherry from a whole region and then produce it at a lower cost and stuff. Um, 
they also instituted minimum pricing. They've had minimum pricing for coffee, but they also, um, both countries have two tier pricing now for coffee cherry, which incentivizes coffee farmers to pick red cherry and not bring in the green cherry or defective cherry. And so they get a high tier price for that coffee and a lower tier price for not so good coffee. So you have to build in you know, some sort of um, incentive towards quality because what all these studies are showing is that the more coffee you can move into specialty coffee, the better your return is going to be on your investment. It's volume, volume cough of, of low quality coffee is not going to be a winning proposition, basically. This was looking at, at, at their attempt to move from the Sojastal system. Um, we, we buy mainly from co-ops and from foreign private companies who have done a really good job there. Um, um, we don't work with any soja stalls or, well, I guess we do work with Burundian private companies because that's what, what um, Agahori is and they're our main exporter. So, um, but, you know, the, the question is, is like that um, what they really need is a connection to the marketplace where they can get buyers sort of like us and a lot more buyers like us. Well, generally, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about here is wet processed coffee. So traditionally, there, there's been a kind of inversion that's happened, and I'll explain. So this is natural coffee is the cherry picked from the tree, laid out to dry as the full cherry with the skin on it. And later on, it's in one step, it's kind of removed from that. And um, washed coffee is, goes through a fermentation process where you take the cherry, you pulp the skin off it, and then you put it in water or dry. And it, within sort of 12 to 24 hours generally, ferments off the, mus the sticky mucilage skin. And so then it, once you wash that off, it dries a lot quicker. Um, this, this in Burundi will take, um, well, sometimes in Burundi this will take 30 days to dry, but this will take, you know, anywhere 30 days to dry. It's very slow. Traditionally, <clears throat> natural coffee was like low quality. It was actually the minimum investment. You didn't have to do anything. You could just put on the ground outside your house. And, and so this was traditionally just bad coffee too. Okay. Now it's kind of inverted where people started putting a lot of work and focus into doing naturals really well because they realized people like the flavor. Yeah, I mean, there are two different styles that are, t I think, totally legitimate, uh, each of them. And, I, you know, it's a, it's a matter of preference to some degree. But what's really great is you can have an amazing range of, like, really fruity washed coffees with, like, Kenyas and stuff and acidic and bright. And then you can have naturals that almost approach washed so it's it's kind of a continuum so there's not one is better than the other no no right. yeah and it's kind of a great thing that i think na uh, specialty wash natural coffee has become um, more available i mean it takes a lot of labor and it's generally more expensive we pay more for it but it um because you know you think of tea and you think of this whole like rainbow of colors in tea or flavors in tea you know and there isn't like what oh, what's a good tea is it you know, just is it black tea? Is it green tea? Is it, you know, there's so much flavor range in tea. And there's no one thing people say, well, that's good tea and that's bad tea. But coffee's been really like kind of like analog in that way. I mean, or, or just, uh, you know, good, bad has been the sort of, you know, clean or not clean. And I think in a lot of, a lot of competitions and stuff, washed coffees became such the focus and this sort of extremely clean, light roast taste that people forgot that this could be really good too. So I'm happy to see a greater range. And there's also honey, honey process, a pulp natural, which is kind of in between the two. And that's when you peel off the mucilage, but you don't ferment it. You leave it on the outside. You've taken off the skin, and then you lay that out to dry. Um, and that kind of produces something in between these two as well. Well, it's, you know, it's supposed to be based on things that actually have to do with coffee, like supply, demand, weather, crop. And those things have typically been, and they still report on those things. Um, 
I, I, I get a I get a daily report from somebody uh, who's a trader that'll say, you know, weather in Brazil is good. They'll they'll include politics in this daily report of like what's going on in coffee, and then they'll have these really technical terms like the shorts are covering their positions for the physical market, and you know you're just like what. Um, but the fact is, is because um, so many trades are executed in coffee um, that have nothing to do with anyone who has anything in coffee. It's all speculation. It's all, you know, looking for places to either park your money in the most risk-free place or the place where you can get the most out of that exchange or whatever your financial goal is. So, um, so it really, most of trading in coffee and volatility doesn't have to do with coffee. There's been definitely moments where there was, crops were good, um, there was no bad weather, there was no short supply, warehouses were full, and yet the price was just going, going crazy. And that was, a lot of that people said were these um, EFT, these exchange tr electronic uh, commodity trading where they follow different commodities and they'll jump from this commodity to that. It could be computer microchips, canola oil, orange juice futures, pork belly, anything, any range of things. And there's more and more financial commodities and also monetary exchange um, uh, speculation. So money's just jumping in and out and you just, you know, and then suddenly, you know, if, if you're actually in coffee and coffee goes berserk, you don't know why. But that's because we don't really have a very good picture of, of the, the whole um, market. And um, I'm going to do this article. It's going to kind of really break down like um, derivatives and, and different options in coffee, the way people protect themselves who really want risk control in coffee. But there's actually such an incentive in, I think, when I'm reading this commodity, uh, with investing in commodities information, it's, it's not a great... <laughs> Not a great investment, but there's such um, an incentive for even a farmer who just wants to do risk control. Um, let's say, you know, if you're going to say, I'm going to fix a price with, uh, you know, and buy into the market, and then what you're going to do is at the end, you're going to sell an equivalent contract. If you don't want to actually take delivery of that coffee, if you want a profit take, you sell an opposing contract. If you, so you either short sell, you, you um, sell to the market, or you buy from the market um, a contract. And, um, but if you're like a farmer and you say, well, look, my price, if I get $1.50, I'm set. So I'm just going to do that right now. But what if the market moves in a direction in your favor and then you're missing out, it goes to $1.80 and you're missing out on 30 cents. Um, you know, how many people want that? Not many people. So there's different financial devices to protect yourself, though you have to pay for them, but you still get some of the advantage of that dollar, uh, of the dollar eighty, for example, or the thirty cents you missed out on, but there's such an incentive for people not to behave carefully <laughs> in when it comes to financial trading. Yeah. So what I really saw in Burundi, this is I'm really glad you asked, is two things. Is first of all, people were were not they know these things, yet they when they have a plot of land, they really don't want to take take a tree out of production. You have to open up space to create light for another tree to come in, or there's different pruning techniques, but even that, they just really are resistant to taking a tree out of production. Um, the other issue a lot of times is the way land gets divided in families because families are big, and if your children all survive, you have 10 children, and you had this much land, they're either gonna have to go out somewhere and work or do something else, or they're each gonna get this diminishing tiny parcel of land with less and less trees on it. So um, that what, what, what we've been trying to do and what I think is really good programs is first of all supplying people with new nursery grown trees. So like a lot of people, these guys I visited, Migoti are doing a really good job. I know Ben Carlson does that. Um, pretty much everybody is trying to grow the plants and then provide them to farmers as an incentive to, 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 to grow trees. And um, uh, 
the, it's uh, you're not you're not supposed to just grow your own coffee from the cherry itself there, and there's probably some re good reason why. So getting really good nursery plants is a reason. There's another program that this company we buy from, who's a one of the foreign private companies, Green Co, did with um, pigs and goats, and I thought I thought this is the dumbest idea. They they get, they had this um, second this after harvest payment for everyone of pigs and goats. Um, and I was like, they're going to eat their pigs and goats and then that's it. And they were like, no, they actually had to sign a contract not to eat their pigs and goats and use them for fertilizer. They can reproduce, they can um, try to get more pigs and goats by uh, reproducing them and sell those as a product. But the whole idea is there's this lack of organic material to put on coffee. And in fact, what I found out in Rwanda especially is that compost is incredibly expensive. Like, they should all be producing compost. There's just not organic material. There's not animal, there's not enough animal product, there's not enough trees there. Um, there's not enough to create really rich compost and there's a huge premium on compost there. And that can eat up the profits from a farm is just doing a good composting. So. Um, there are a lot of really cool ideas um, that push farmers towards decisions that you know will lead to better better outcomes in the future. But um, one of them I hate to see is planting uh, some other high yield variety. I, them staying with Bourbon coffee is is really ideal, um, if if at all possible. But there are some good um, Bourbon types of coffee that do have better yields. There's this one that we get from, you'll see it on our list from Guatemala called B, Bourboncito or B300 and that's a mini shrub Bourbon that produces really well. So some of those ideas would be really good. That'd be illegal in Burundi. <laughs> You're only allowed to grow one. The, the government, th this is where the government's very frustrating there. They have a, a part of their agriculture office that's supposed to supply the official seed and you have to buy it from them and it's okay, the price is fine. They just don't actually do it. So this private company did all their own nurseries based on their own seed and the government came, they were talking about it, somebody said to somebody, to something to somebody, they came and the government burned their nurseries down. <laughs> Uh, to, to eliminate all this seed that they were going to give to farmers. So the politics there is a little wacky and um, that can happen. Well, yeah, it goes to one of several dry mills and we usually consolidate the coffee at the dry mill. Um, so one of them that we use is a cooperative dry mill called Oramama and the other is the uh, Bujastel dry mill, Budeca in Gitega. And then from there, Burundi is kind of difficult. It has to go by truck through Tanzania to Dar es Salaam. Um, so it's kind of a long journey since it's landlocked, basically, um, a landlocked country. Yeah. And then, uh -huh. or we use a service to, to, to help us import. And um, so the, yeah, the main issue there, I think a lot of, um, people who start out in coffee and have really great intentions of like, I'm just, I'm going to find a farmer somewhere. I'm going to give them a great price. I'm going to bring in this coffee. And we get calls. I don't know if we've had any lately of like, I went to Nicaragua and I have 15 bags of coffee that I need to, to get. Um, can you help me? And it's like, well, that's the whole problem is you, you unless you want to fly, you know, have really big checked bags or, or, um, or actually fly the coffee out in, a, in an air transport, which will cost you, you know, which you're going to be paying the airlines a huge amount of money, and they usually abuse the coffee anyway. Uh, it's, it's really hard. It's hard. Coffee is hard to work um, on really small scales like that. Um, you can ship a slack container, like a 20-foot shipping container with 50 bags in it. It just gets very expensive. So um, the logistics are not, yeah. And it's amazing to me because I go to these countries like uh, Ethiopia grows tons of fresh flowers for the for the uh, European market. All Kenya, oh my God, there's just all this is like just in time, you know, fresh cut arugula at the airport in Nairobi is in Amsterdam the next morning, and you know, in the markets that afternoon. It's like, wait, why can't why can't we do better with coffee? <laughs> you know, like why is it why how can they do that and we? 
but um, a little bit. I mean, it's also it's a product that needs curing. I mean, it's it's dried. It it needs that time, um, and then it it you know is a very stable product after that. Not as stable as people used to think, where they keep it for for uh, years and years. So what's amazing here is that we. It, there wasn't a per, there was an organization and there still is called the ICO and the International Coffee Organization and they had the ICA the International Coffee Agreement and the International Coffee Agreement was a quota system where each country could not overproduce coffee in order to flood the market um, huh yeah, they were given, there was an agreement, but it was, um, and the United States always opposed it, but every other country was pretty okay with it. And what would happen is, is if your country overproduced, you actually had to store that coffee in warehouses. So in Brazil, when they would just have crop surpluses that would potentially drag down the whole coffee market, um, you know, it was kind of artificially supported by the fact that they couldn't flood the market with their coffee. Um, and what you would end up with is stocks in these certified warehouses in Brazil that were 30 years old. You'd have this like coffee that was sitting forever of so-called exchange grade coffee, which I would love to have tasted, but it probably would be like dry kindling at that point. You put a match and it would just go psh. Um, they actually sold all this coffee through the 80s. They tried to keep the I ICA uh, viable um, basically with US um, uh, opposing it, it fell apart. I'm thinking, um, in, it, it kind of had, they tried to restart it in something, but it, st it started sort of falling apart um, in the 80s, uh, kind of under Reagan and liberalization and kind of, glo you know, um, free trade as we move towards free trade. And the problem is, is it, was a, it was not a perfect system, but it was a really good system for stability, which is, you know, if this market is supposed to serve people who actually grow coffee and people who actually buy coffee, and ultimately consumers just to know, okay, this is, you know, this is what I can expect. Um, so I believe a lot of the volatility that you're seeing here was from the fall up, the failings of, of when, when the ICA uh, fell apart, especially um, from, from this point, the, I don't know. I think this was a, the giant crop failure in Brazil, if I am right, and I could be totally wrong. And then um, this uh, in the 80s, you know, you have a spike here, but it's basically just a, a quick trip down. Um, so uh, that was, um, and, and, you know, honestly, I think that's kind of what we need at this point. It's sort of like, um, capitalism with rules, you know, with stronger rules. You need to have the price discovery of people being able to lock in a price they're happy with and they can function with and a buyer finding a price they can function with so that, so that people continue to make deals. And yet you need you know, some guidelines, you need some rules. So in a lot of these countries, what it's been is the minimum cherry price. You know, they try to institute a minimum cherry price so that um, farmers know they're being paid, you know, wh what they're going to get. And in Burundi, that's 500 francs, which is just not, not enough, really. However, I think that that is a good direction to go. Um, so there's a lot of political solutions. I think um, there may be less market solutions, but there's more political solutions that I think really make sense. And then, of course, if your biggest players in the market actually had any ethics <laughs> in terms of sourcing coffee um, on, the, on the big scale. They can use their small brands and, oh, we pay fair, we do this, we do that. But if they actually instituted their own minimum pricing, um, which is just an investment in their own coffee, if you, you know, in the fact that they need coffee in the future to buy and people aren't going to grow it at these prices, um, that would be incredibly meaningful um, to the future coffee. It's tricky. I mean, what happens is that um, there's two organizations that do fair trade now. One of them only worked with co-ops before, and one of them started accepting private farms and private um, 
companies as, as fair trade. I mean, I think there's countries where fair trade has worked really well to support like livelihoods of a lot of people, and there's other places where maybe it hasn't. And there's a problem in that when people decide they're going to contract fair trade coffee from a co-op, that co-op may or may not have that coffee. And if they don't have that coffee, what I know happens a lot is they just go buy it from other people. Um, because you're not actually, it's not fair trade to the farmer, it's fair trade to the co-op. So how, the co-op has rules about how, what they're supposed to do with that, but I've been to a lot of co-ops where farmers never saw a second payment that they're supposed to get with fair trade. Um, so it's really not easy to verify that you know, fair trade trickles down to the farmers or the casual workers in coffee. However, you know, it is a good, another option for addressing these problems. So. Yeah, I mean, he worked for other people and then started out on his own. So there's obviously people who think there's a future in coffee like him. But so, yeah, there's, there's a couple things that I forgot to really touch on there. First is that he owns a washing station and that coffee there is probably produced by a thousand farmers. So that's the situation in Burundi is like you're always dealing with not a farm, but like a thousand farmers. Any, uh, we figured that any lot of coffee we had was at least 250 farmers grew the coffee. So how do you work with that farmer? You don't really, you work with them through the station and uh, through the washing station, etc. So it gets very tricky in terms of like, how do I, figure out what cost of production works for farmers when they're in so many you know, situations like that. And it takes some real research, which I can't do. Um, but the other thing that you said is competition. is like so important and uh, is like how many people are knocking on his door. So there's been a lot of places where I've been where the price is really supported by the fact that there's a lot of competition in the area. And if, if I don't buy it, this other person will buy it. So I, you know, so it makes everybody behave a little better. Um, in any place I've been where a coffee farmer only has one choice and one source, one person to sell to, their cherry or their parchment, it's never a good situation. So getting more co local competition for coffee is really important. Um, and you know, having a local co-op as an option. So places I go like Colombia or Guatemala, there's great competition in those areas and that really supports um, the pricing and gives farmers like a lot of options of who to sell to and what to do. So, no, I mean, the cost of cherry really do, is important to what the, what you call the FOB price of coffee. Like in Kenya, the price to the farmer is really very directly correlated because it eats up most of the, the, the money. And they have these marketing agents who make a percentage. But uh, if, your cherry, if your cherry price in an area is high, your coffee is going to be very expensive. So, you know, it's that six to one um, ratio from cherry to green. Um, where does the money go? It's... Um, yeah, I mean, it's complicated. I think on our side, um, you have to look at the, <laughs> she's gonna jump up on you. You have to look at like um, pretty much any product, like what's, what, is the, what is the contents of a can of Coke cost? What's the actual Coca-Cola in the can cost? You know, what's the, what's the, the, the package cost? What's getting it on the shelf cost? Oh, Paul. Um, you know, uh, what's the advertising cost? So when you look at the substance itself, it seems like it's nothing because all these other costs are added on. And for every service and every time that's exchanged, somebody is making money. So especially with, with um, coffee that goes through exchanges, come on, Opal. It may be traded so many times and every trade represents an increase, somebody making money. In the coffee supply chain, I don't think it's that, it's not super complicated, it's fairly direct. However, it goes from, you know, if the farmer either sells cherry or parchment, that depends, then it goes to the washing station. So you have your cherry price, 
you have your washing station taking the coffee and then the washing station will be they're basically who like I would be dealing with so that's fairly direct um, then it's going to go to a dry mill and the dry mills going to take their price and you're going to have your exporter who's going to consolidate it and they take a price and to me all that's pretty much known and open like I know um, I know what I know that sort of all those costs so um, I think that um, your ocean logistics is going to add you know minimal price and it's pretty much on the retail end where you get your biggest price increase you know for sure um, and I think that is sort of like you can look around and see like your coffee shop serving your cup of coffee if they're serving 200 cups of coffee a day or 300 cups of coffee a day they're doing pretty good but it's like they're you look at everything that they're paying for with that coffee and what an employee costs you and for example in California etc so um, so you never get an even distribution from your supply to your thing because the Miss, you know, the, the the costs are so weighted on our side. I think, you know, if an employee you pay them 15 an hour, they're probably costing you 30 an hour, and then you multiply that by how many you have and and your facility and and other things, and it just is. That's where I think you get it. I've always um, wanted to present to farmers the cost breakdown on our side. I think that would be very interesting for them to understand like how the coffee comes here, what we do with it, and what the costs are involved. Um, because I think they're very curious and they see retail prices for coffee of like, like well, I don't know what, blue bottles like 20, 25 a pound and you wonder how can that be when the, the farmer got, you know, 30 cents, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, for our businesses is really different. We're, we're kind of just, you know, to be honest, we're just sort of a not a big growth business. We're just kind of like to do what we do. So we're not trying to like fund further coffee shops and stuff by with what we're doing now. And that's like, you know, a little bit rare, I guess, in coffee. I mean, I think there's a lot of shops that are just like, no, this is what we are, this is what we do, like a local shop. But you have a lot of people that are very interested in growth, and that takes just a lot of money. And they're either going to raise that money themselves or they're going to get investors. And then the investors are really going to pressure them for profitability. So, um, you know, so coffee really gets a lot of pressure put on it to make a lot of money off, off the, the cup. And I don't know. Uh, yeah. Okay. Did you guys have anything else? Okay. Thanks a lot, you guys. I'm sorry if this was disorganized.